Here are a few of the strangest results from social experiments. Number 9. Class Division The year was 1968 and the Dr. Martin Luther King tragedy had just happened. A primary school teacher, Jane Elliott, decided to teach her students about how bias worked. In 1968, Elliott was teaching third grade, so this meant her classroom was full of eight and nine-year-olds. Not only that, but her classroom was white only. She didn't have a single student of color. So how did she make them understand racism? She designed a little activity. She divided her class into two groups, green-eyed children and brown-eyed children. Just a note, the kids' actual eye color didn't matter. The kids had construction paper armbands that represented their group's eye color. That first day, she told the blue-eyed children in front of the brown-eyed kids that they were special. She knew that the children weren't going to buy her pitch unless she came up with a reason. She told her students that eye color, hair color, and skin color are caused by a chemical called melanin, and it's what causes intelligence. The more melanin, the darker the person's eyes, and the smarter the person. She also added that the blue-eyed people sit around and do nothing. She gives them something nice and they just wreck it. She could feel a chasm forming between the two groups of students. Right afterwards, the blue-eyed kids started behaving differently. They became arrogant and disrespectful toward the brown-eyed kids. At the same time, the brown-eyed children began to accept their position. They showed signs of deep stress and their academic performance suffered. However, the next day, Elliot reversed the roles in the classroom. Now she told the brown-eyed group they were superior. This time, results were slightly different. As they knew what it felt like to be discriminated, brown-eyed children were more sensitive to the suffering of the other group. Jane Elliott's exercise is controversial still to this day, and sometimes it's cited as a landmark of social science. Number 8. Majority Rule Would you say you're a conformist or a non-conformist? Most people want to say they are undoubtedly non-conformist and they believe they could stand up to a group when they know they're right. Unfortunately, one researcher was able to show that people are willing to give the wrong answer just to conform to the rest of the group. In 1951, Solomon Ash conducted a series of conformity experiments. Imagine this scenario. After you volunteer to participate in a psychological experiment, you're led to a room full of other participants. You don't know that these people aren't actual participants, they're in the experiment as actors and their behavior is carefully scripted. You and the rest of the participants are shown a line segment drawn on a piece of paper. Then each person is asked to choose the line segment that's the same length from a group of three lines. Easy enough, right? Well, each person gives their answer out loud and they all chose the line you thought was shorter than the original. What do you do? Do you keep your original answer because you know you're right? Or do you start to doubt yourself? The Ash experiments reach the conclusion that a person will tend to agree with the majority if they believe they're among equals. No matter what you think you'll do, according to Ash, at least one third of the time, you'll just conform to the group. Number seven, the Hawthorne effect. The Hawthorne effect refers to the tendency of pretty much all participants in any psychological experiment to perform according to the expectations of the experimenters. It was first observed in an electrical factory in Hawthorne, Illinois in the 1950s. The owners hired a team of psychologists to determine how the productivity of workers could improve. When they did their research, they found a very strange phenomenon. Anytime work conditions were modified, productivity increased. Only once the experiment was over, productivity returned to its normal levels. This was strange because it happened whether the environment was actually improved or not. The smallest changes increased productivity. Even when worsening the work environment, productivity increased. Experimenters reduced the light to candlelight level, and they lengthened the shift, and productivity still increased. Then, breaks were eliminated entirely, and productivity still, you guessed it, increased. How was this possible? It turns out subjects in psychological experiments will tend to alter their behavior because of the attention received. Essentially, anytime someone knows or thinks they're being watched, they'll alter their behavior. This means that in the Hawthorne case, the workers weren't responding to the modified work environment, but rather to the attention of the experimenters. In 2009, however, a team of psychologists found that the original Hawthorne data and the results were largely overstated. However, later experiments were able to confirm the Hawthorne effect. Number six, altered memory. Memory is a shifty thing. It's not very reliable and it can be altered at will. 
This is why eyewitnesses can't always be trusted. Elizabeth Loftus, in a series of experiments, proved how the memory of an event can be modified, changed, or supplemented by the tiniest shifts in the wording of questions about a memory. In 1974, Loftus showed the participants of her experiments videos of cars crashing into each other. Right after that, she asked the participants to estimate the speed at which they thought the cars were going when the accident happened. She decided this question was best to understand the altered memory effect because in general, people are bad at estimating speeds and thus their perceptions are open to variation. She asked the question to five groups, wording it differently every time. She used the words smashed, collided, bumped, hit, and contacted to refer to the accident. The question was this, how fast were the cards going when they blank each other? The group of participants that were asked the smash question estimated the speed of the cars to be higher than the group of participants who were asked the hit question. Later on, she asked the participants if they recalled seeing broken glass. There was no broken glass in the video, but participants in the smash group claimed they remembered glass. This experiment showed that memory isn't fixed in our brains and that memories cannot be completely trusted. Number five, just following orders. If an authority figure asked you to hit someone, would you do it? After World War II, many people asked how people were able to do horrible things just to follow orders. Stanley Milgram designed some experiments to prove that people are really quite prone to obedience. During the 60s, Milgram designed what would later be called obedience studies. A participant was told that they were the teacher and the other, the other participant, who was in fact an actor, was the learner. In the experiment, the teacher had to ask a series of questions, but the trick was this. Every time the learner made a mistake, the teacher had to give them an electrical shock. However, this electrical shock would increase in intensity every time. At least that's what the unsuspecting participant believed. The second time the learner made a mistake, the shock would be higher, and so on. As the test went on, the screams of pain of the learner would be higher and more desperate. At the last mistake, the actor would scream and pretend to lose consciousness. The results were shocking. Surprisingly, the study found 63% of the participants, the teachers, were willing to obey just because they were told to do it. Number four, the bystander effect. People like to believe that they are good. When asked, most people say they, of course, would help someone if someone had an accident right in front of them. But this belief was torn by what's known as the bystander effect. Basically, the bystander effect is this. The time it takes a person Take action and seek help in case of an emergency varies depending on how many other people are in the room. Or, to put it simply, everyone thinks someone else will do something and the result is that no one does anything. The bystander effect was observed and later studied because of poor Kitty Genovese in 1964. She was approached by her apartment door when returning from work. She was assaulted in an attack that lasted at least half an hour. Despite her cries for help, not one person called the police. Initial report said that there were at least 38 people nearby, but still no one intervened or called the emergency services. The bystander effect explains that responsibility in front of an emergency tends to dissolve when there are many people in one room. Suddenly, no one is responsible. Number three, cognitive dissonance. Everyone would like to believe they are consistent. This means that their beliefs and their actions are coherent among them. Yet, there's this little thing called cognitive dissonance that's basically when a person holds conflicting beliefs and essentially flip-flops when it comes to a certain situation. One of the most common examples of cognitive dissonance is in being environmentally friendly. People will recycle their plastic and glass bottles, but then drive around on a large SUV or truck when they don't need to. Another example would be in eating healthy. How many times have we seen people order a supersized meal at McDonald's and then see the person try and save a few calories with a diet drink? Or what about the people that believe exercise is important, but they rarely make time for physical activity? Pretty much everyone wants to feel like they're making choices that are consistent. People try to seek consistency in their thoughts, beliefs, and opinions. So when there are conflicts between cognitions, people will take steps to reduce the dissonance and feelings of discomfort. Essentially, it's called coming up with excuses. Number two, robber's cave experiment. Can hatred be manufactured? The robber's cave experiment was designed by Muzaffar Sherry to prove intergroup conflicts can be developed if competing for resources. In the experiment, Sharif placed 22 boys in two groups at a camp in the robber's cave park, hence the name. 
The boys were all between the ages of 11 and 12, and they all came from similar backgrounds. In the first phase of the experiment, the boys were made to bond with each other through a series of exercises. In the second phase, the boys finally learned there was another group. The experimenters placed the two groups near each other, and now the activities were all about competition, such as baseball or tug-of-war. The boys, who were previously a bit hesitant about their own group, now showed signs of deep belonging. They favored their own group and rejected the other group. Fights came up in common areas when it was eating time or bathroom time. But why would these boys consider the other group rivals? They were all very much alike at the end of the day. The answer is competition. What the Robbers Cave experiment proved was that much conflict around the world boils down to competition. But really, it took studies to figure that out. Number one, just walking around. In 2015, makeup artist Sandra Baker designed a bold statement. No pants are the best pants. Originally from the Netherlands, Baker is a creative makeup designer who resides in Hong Kong. She's worked for many sci-fi movies and TV commercials as a full body makeup artist. So a few years ago, she designed a campaign to see how observant people really are. She claimed she could paint clothes on a person and have them walk around and no one would notice. And this is exactly what happened. Baker painted jeans on her models as realistically as she could. Models walked around wearing only paint, but it looked so realistic, no one noticed at first. Baker did the experiment in New York City and also in Hong Kong. Models would walk around in both cities, climb stairs, and get on buses and subways. Still, most people did not notice that a model was walking around without any pants on. Only a few times did some people take notice and give a reaction. But really, either people just don't care or they're too busy minding their own business. Is this the bystander effect again? Here's what's next. Old lost her job as a math teacher in 2015 when she was found to be having a relationship with a 17-year-old male student. The Austin, Texas native was arrested in March of 2017 and was sentenced to 10 years of probation. Even though 17 is the legal age of consent in Texas, it's still against the law for teachers to be...